Good morning, everyone. I'm glad you can join us today for our morning worship and prayer. And as we begin this day, I want us to be reminded that whatever situation we are in right now, we can rejoice in the Lord. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. So let's rejoice and exalt the name of the Lord as we begin worshiping him today this morning.
The story that we're going to look into for our devotional time today takes place on the onset of Jesus' ministry here on earth. And as Jesus starts off his ministry, he reads a very familiar verse taken from the book of Isaiah. And it says here in Luke 4 verse 18 to 19, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. You know what? A very powerful declaration as Jesus starts off his earthly ministry. But what's more powerful is his claim that this is not just a promise to come, but in the next verse, he declares this in verse 21. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. You see, the prophecy in Isaiah is a promise of God's deliverance for the nation of Israel through a Messiah. And Jesus declaring that the scripture being fulfilled in their hearing that day is him claiming to be the Messiah. And it's interesting to note that the first, that at first, you know, verse 22 tells us that they all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. But the mood changed in verse 28 because it says there that when they heard these things, all the synagogue were filled with wrath. You know, they were so angry that they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. Wow, grabe no, they were so angry that they were willing to throw him off the cliff. So what happened in between those verses that made these people listening to Jesus at that time furious to the point that they wanted to kill him? Well, he referred to two miracles from the Old Testament, the provision of the widow of Zarephath and the healing of Naaman. So it says here, let's read that. But in truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet of Elisha, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. Now for us, these are very encouraging miracle stories, but why did this offend the people then? For those listening to him during that time, it was offensive because first and foremost, the recipients of the miracles are both Gentiles, meaning they're not Israelites. Imagine in a time of great famine, God showed himself able to provide through a Gentile widow. And this is not the kind of Messiah that they were expecting. They were expecting someone who would rescue them from the oppression of the Gentile nations. And yet, here is Jesus saying that God cares even for those who are outsiders. Not only that, both miracle stories happened during the time when His chosen people, the Israelites, were rejecting His chosen messengers, Elijah, and Elisha. And this is greatly offensive for them because Jesus was comparing them to the time when their forefathers' hearts were hardened such that they failed to see and refused to receive from Him. You see, if you look at these miracle stories, and you can actually read further in 1 Kings 17 and 2 Kings 5, you'd notice that though the external need might seem different for the widow and Naaman, they are both poor, blind, and oppressed. For the widow, it's easy to see because of the obvious lack that she is experiencing, which made her reluctant to give whatever she has to the prophet. But Elijah told her not to be afraid and trust the word of the Lord. And we know what happened. God greatly provided beyond what she can imagine. And it led her to believe and live by the word of God. But in Naaman's case, it was harder to see because he seemingly has the power to get everything and do everything. And yet in the end, he realized that only God can give him wholeness. That's why his declaration is this in 2 Kings 5.15. He says, Behold, I know that there is no God in all earth but in Israel. Again, going back to Jesus' declaration, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Poor, captive, blind, and oppressed. This is who Jesus came to set free. The people then were furious because they refused to acknowledge the poorness in their soul, the captivity in their minds, the blindness of their hearts, and the oppression of their spirit. Jesus came to offer freedom for the captive, sight to the blind, and liberty for the oppressed. 
You see, unless they recognize that they are as poor, as blind, and as captive as the widow and Naaman, they would fail to see, receive, and follow the Messiah. The people then were blinded by their sense of national pride, exclusivity, religiosity. More than the nations oppressing them, their greatest oppressions come from this. And that is what Jesus wants to set them free from. Now today, Jesus is offering the same liberty for all of us. And as we end this devotional, I want us to ask the Lord this. Now, what are the areas in our lives that have been blinded, oppressed, or held captive by certain ideologies, beliefs, or traditions that have made our hearts hard to see and receive Jesus' truths and miracles in our lives? Allow God to minister to you and set you free. Lord, thank you for sending our greatest miracle, Jesus, to set us free from our greatest oppression and captivity. As we desire to walk with you and in you, may you continue to allow us to see areas in our lives that have been blinded, oppressed, or held captive by the things that are not from you. Thank you, Jesus, for the freedom that you've given us. May you continue to allow us to live in it. Amen. Now let's continue to allow God to speak to us as we respond in worship unto Him. With your power, your presence, we will go to the ends of the earth. With your power, your presence, As we end our time together, allow me to send you off with this blessing from Galatians 5 verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm therefore and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. God bless everyone and may we continue to live our freedom in Christ.